Welcome to the StatMed Podcast, where we teach you how to study in med school and how to pass board-style exams. Your host is Ryan Orwig, a learning specialist who has over a decade of experience working with med students and physicians. In this two-part episode, Ryan and Dr. Jim Colhane continue their discussion on test-taking on medical boards and in the med school and PharmD classroom. And so we're all largely conditioned to make a determination. Do I know it or do I not? Right. And predicting the answer option is beneficial in my in my estimation on a first order question. Let me predict yeah. who and the fifth president right. is and see if it's down there. Right. But when we get to this level of this very unique construct of clinical vignette, multiple choice exams, the kind of thing we see on step one, step two, step three, the NAPLEX, the NAVLE, specialty board, subspecialty board shelf exams. They're different creatures. Yes, they are. So a related thing I wanted to throw at you uh, is what I call the problem of Schrodinger's cat. Okay. So Schrodinger's cat. Now, I only know about this through like reading blogs about time travel movies, mm-hmm. uh, and alternate realities and quantum realities. Yeah. I don't know about it from the actual science because that's not my not, not my deal. Uh, I think I read about it first, it, probably talking about some episode of Lost. Oh, I know. I learned it in physics class, but that was many years ago. And <laughs> I did not take that class. So yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, I uh, <laughs> so I learned. So anyway. The idea of Schrodinger's cat is this. Let's say I'm reading a passage, a a clinical vignette, most appropriate next step in management and treatment, whatever. Mm -hmm. And let's say it's a question. We'll keep it simple. It's a bunch of people go on a trip. They come back. The the patient and somebody else has a rash. They describe the rash. Um, You're trying to figure out the most appropriate next step, say, in diagnosis. I'll change it. So we got to figure out. We have to suspect what the person has. And then we have to draw the conclusion. What do we think this person has up in the passage? And then down below is going to be some sort of test that will either confirm the suspicion or get us closer to that suspicion. Mm -hmm. So this is the second, third order question because you have to hold, you have to, you have to arrive at what you think the person has. So what you are not allowed to do is come up with multiple realities, multiple diagnoses. You can't be like, well, if it's scabies, then this, but if it's poison ivy, then this, and you can't hold in the box and not in the box. Right. Or, or the cat's alive and dead. I don't know. I don't know. Or so alive maybe, and dead. Right. That's right. Yeah. That, right. I, I mean, like I said, I, I didn't actually learn about it. I just read about it as a, uh, as a, as a, as a thing to explain whatever, whatever show I was watching or movie I was right. watching. So, but yeah, that's the idea. So you, you can't roll with Schrodinger's cat operating with two reality or a quantum reality of, 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 of then going, because, you know, the, our blueprint is like, you have to work through the first phase. The first phase is everything above the answer options. The, yeah. the, the question being asked, the, the, the clinical scenario, any images, any labs. And if, if in, a, in a next step question, you have to come up with a suspected diagnosis. You can't right. be like, maybe scabies, maybe poison ivy. Right. Like you can't do that. It's impossible. Well, but what if it's one of, what if I'm wrong? Then you're going to miss the question. Like right. go with the thing you think. And if you're not sure, you'd be like, well, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. You don't even know enough to guess. Then you've got to say, well, this does it look like it's, something broadly in one category versus broadly in the other, not going with both categories. So this is an important thing that's sort of a newer concept that we've really started hammering on. And it Mm -hmm. seems to really help provide some clarity um, moving forward in in, in those kind of testing constructs. If I, you know, and I want, you said something that really resonated with me too, and with my students. Um, So one of the things that I've seen, you know, more and more over the last, you know, five or six years are students with severe test anxiety, right? Okay. They get into a test. Uh, as an academic coach, I work with them all the time. They get into a test. They start the test. They take the first three, four, five questions, and then they yep. freeze, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I can always tell these students, you know, in, in, in some ways, because they're the ones that are done in 20 minutes for yeah. in a two-hour test, they just give up uh, because they've frozen. And one of the things that really resonated with me when as I'm lear- learning this methodology and, and having talked to a lot of these students and working with them is that y- the methodology or st- the stepwise methodology yeah. and approach, right? And the fact that the, and the coding system that you use for each of the answers, forcing yeah. them to say, look, 
this is what I think the right answer is. This is a, you know, a, a possibility, you know, and I won't get into the coding system here because sure. that's not, but it really, I think in a lot of ways, and then when you say, look, whatever the highest level code that you have on an answer, that's your answer, yeah. you know, and then move on and don't worry about it. Don't, don't sweat it. You know, it's, and I think that could be really freeing. It is. It is. That it's, are, um, Oh yeah, test anxiety is a legit thing. What oh, I yeah. tell people is now I'm not I'm not a, a, a you know I'm not a clinician I'm not a therapist. Yeah, neither what am I. Tell I. Pe- what I tell people is, and take all this with a grain of salt. Like if, if it's a generalized anxiety disorder that has been mm-hmm. diagnosed, and 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 not properly and not treated, well that methodology can't cut through that. That's a bigger issue that has to be right. addressed through the proper channels. Now most test anxiety. Again, there might be like a far end of the spectrum that, that where this maybe is, is not not valid, but most people who cite legit test anxiety, this locking up, this freezing up, like the, the, the retrieval pathways are shutting down, everything gets hazy. Like generally speaking, methodology, our methodology can cut through that type of anxiety. Hey, it, absolutely. It, it's, it, a, it's a safety blanket. It really is. Because, well, and listen, and, and hear me out here too, because I think a lot of times what happens with students, and, and I talk, when I talk to students, but well, what happened? You know, they, they, you know, when they start to freeze up, they don't know what to do. They don't have, you know, there's nowhere, like, to, go. They have no there's nowhere to go, right? Nowhere to go. It's sort, of, yeah. it's sort of like, it's sort of like if you're on an airplane that's crashing, right? And the, and the flight attendant didn't go through all of the crash procedures with you, you know, mm-hmm. you're like, you freeze up. OK, sure. Or, sure. or OK, as I was in the military, you know, if you you know, they dr- they spend, you know, basic training, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks drilling you how to you operate your rifle and to, and to move under fire and things like that so that it happens automatically in those high yeah. stress situations. Right. Right. If you're getting shot at, that's a high stress, anxious you know, situation. And so what I when I'm as I was learning something to myself, here is the 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 uh, and i'm 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 missing words here but here is a approach you can learn that can kick in automatically mm-hmm. if you're feeling it and just so that you can and so that you can approach a question and break through the freezing right because that's really well, what you want it to be i want people to unhook their locus of control from their emotions yes. and their personality yes. and their judgment yes. and hook it on the system. It's yes. like, hey, it's not personal, guys. The system says I have to pick C with a weak yes. maybe because everything else is a slash or a question mark. I, you know, really and, and you'd be like freaking out, like I'm, I've got to pick something I don't know a lot about. I don't like that. And it's like, hey, man, it's not personal. Or I don't know the system. answer. Oh my god, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. What do I do? And you freeze, and it's like, yeah. okay, well, wait a minute. All right, if you follow the approach and the steps, all right, yes. and if you have partial knowledge. And mm-hmm. you just take your time and take a deep breath. The likelihood of you getting that question right is much, much higher. Well, and we train so that it's not even about getting it right. You train them in c- to condition like I'm going to miss questions. Right. I'm going to miss questions. Uh, I'm not going to get every question right. If I narr- if I have a question mark, a question where I've got three slashes and three question marks, that means I don't know the answer. Don't spend much time there. Pick one of the three question marks and get out. That's better guessing one out of si- one out of three, one out of six. Set bank that time moving forward. But yeah, the idea is like you train so rigidly with the system that then you can lean on the system. And, and when anxiety is there, you're still going through some of those waves, those profound waves of anxiety that are just right. bashing you in those first few hours of, say, the board exam. But then your ship is still intact at the end when the when the storm has worn itself out after a few hours. Whereas without a system, the storm obliterates you. And then your test is over, like you have you, the damage is, is, is like you put you like in an air, uh, you, you know, you can't recover from the hole you're in um, and, and Let me, warn you, know you what? out. Here, I mean, here's a little anecdote, if you'll bear with me on yeah. this, because I think it really and I think your your listeners may resonate with this. So, as I mentioned before, I was an emergency medical technician and combat medic, and I ran ambulance for about 10 years. And my last my very last call as an EMT when I hung up my stethoscope and my shears and all that stuff, and I never went on an ambulance, it was 10 minutes before my shift was over. And the paramedic I was running with, Melissa at the time, we got a call for a child choking. And it was it was like 
five minutes from the ambulance garage. So we drive up and, you know, she, she's in the back getting the oxygen, the innovation equipment. She sends me up the hill. People are yelling and waving for us. And I get up there and there's this four-year-old kid and his, his mother is holding on to him and she turns him around and he's blue like a Smurf, right? Mm. I have, you know, again, I was trained in all of this, but I'd never seen a choking victim like this. Right. Yeah. And I kneel down in front of this kid and I'm like, okay, what do I need to do? I'm like, uh, okay, first thing, call 911. And I, I swear this went through my head, right? Call 911 wow. and then wait, I am 911. Okay, second, <laughs> story, right? I mean, it's so funny, but just in a split second. And then I'm like, okay, yeah. next thing, Heimlich maneuver, right? And so, you know, I knew exactly what to do. So the training kicked in, yeah. you know, in a, in a moment where I could have been paralyzed, right? Yep. You know, it's the training and the thought process that kicked in. And long story short, we were able to dislodge the obstructed airway. It was a grape that, uh, that the kid had swallowed. You know, he, you know, he, after a little bit of oxygen, he was back in the, the his living room watching cartoons. His wow. little sister comes over to us and she says to us, and we we're both exhausted at this point. Thank you for saving my brother's life. And we, wow. uh, and I both cried and that was it. I said, yeah. I'm done now. I'm going to go check out. And <laughs> I've, done my, I've done my, but again, it just illustrates it's the, training. Done, the training and the methodology. Yes. And that's Sorry. why methodology has to be rigid. It has to be structured. And this is why I tell so people will ask, like, how long in advance should I do the board's workshop? And yeah. I say, well, you want to yeah. at least have three weeks. I mean, three weeks is tight. Anything yeah. less than three weeks, I'm feeling really uncomfortable. Um, because it's, it's bringing the system on board, on, what, what Dave and I call onboarding the system to somebody is not that hard. You yeah. know, give it seven, 10 days, you can onboard it. But the back half, is the training and the behavior change. Yes. We have the tools for that. They're, they're built in. They are very meticulous. They're very demanding in a good way. But if somebody asks me, how long is that going to take me? I'd say, I don't know. I don't know because behavior change is hard. Yep. This is a fact of human nature. Like it it, behavior change is hard. It takes time. What may, It might take one person five days. It might take somebody else 15 days. It might just take somebody else 30 days. It might some, take somebody... Five hours of concentrated practice. It might take somebody 30 hours of concentrated practice. You just don't know. But this is why it's so important to have the knowledge and have the access to the practice questions to be able to actually train. This is why, sorry, Mark, like we're going to talk about here. We'll wrap this up talking about something like the like first year and second year uh, test training. Yeah. Um, a lot harder. It's a lot harder. Um, the good news is like like human medicine, the practice questions are so good now compared to when I started 15 years ago. Um, the human medicine practices questions are really good. Uh, the veterinary medicine questions are still not very good for the NAVLI. Yeah. Uh, but what we found out is they're good enough to induce uh, the, the like the training of the skills and the behavior modification so we can see have really good results on, on test day. Uh, some of the students, like the specialty boards, and subspecialty boards in human medicine, usually not as good because I well, guess there's probably not as much money for it. To, that's to really interesting because the NAPLEX, which is the pharmacy licensure examination, yeah. again, about five or six years ago, um, they revamped the NAPLEX and it became a lot of clinical case vignettes questions. And what we saw yeah. after the exam was changed, board exams uh, scores nationally, the NAPLEX pass rate for the first time in decades plummeted. Right. Wow. Um, you know, so. and, you know, and they've recovered since then because we've, you know, we've figured it out. But still, you know, I think, you know, this methodology would be hugely helpful. Oh, yeah. Um, for them, especially when, you, when you're talking about these second and third order questions. Yeah. So one thing we were going to also talk about is the nature of for, like, you know, the nature of this, the, the evolution of this testing design. Like, like you said, we, we haven't done the research on this. It'd be something to, to talk about the research of it. Yeah. But I, you know, what we were talking earlier before the podcast about um, the, you know, the nature of partial knowledge versus the binary mentality. Yeah. So that that's a that, that's a key part of our philosophy and something that really resonated with you that you you sort of wanted to talk about. I think. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, I think that um, you know we were talking just about the psychology of this, right? Behavior change yeah. and things like that. And I think you know, you and I, I think both agree that there's a ton of psychology involved in just taking an exam. Right. Yeah. And right. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that one of the things that really hit me too, as I'm taking through this and listening to what you're talking is that, you know, most students, most health, most health profession students, and I know my pharmacy students are this way, 
are are they learn how to take exam by you know binary types of questions first order well, yeah, well culturally they, though jim culturally we yeah. all grow up like i'm a liberal arts background right. guy oh, okay we, right. we grow up if it's not an essay test if it's right, not exactly. a fill in the blank it is a if it's multiple choice it is a first order question right if multiple choice is like who was the fifth president of the united states do you exactly. know or do you not it's you who wants to be a millionaire right who wants to be a millionaire questions you right. know, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, E. And so we're all largely conditioned to make a determination. Do I know it or do I not? Right. And predicting the answer option is beneficial in my in my estimation on a first order question. Let me predict yeah, who the fifth president right. is and see if it's down there. Let right, me predict exactly. before I look at the who wants to be a millionaire questions. Right. But. When we get to this level of this very unique construct of clinical vignette, multiple choice exams, the kind of thing we see on step one, step two, step three, the NAPLEX, the Navely, specialty board, subspecialty board shelf exams, they're different creatures. Yes, there are words up top. Yes, yep. there's A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, whatever. Right. I, I think the fact that it's like A, B, C, D, like it just makes us all think it's the same deal, the same and, rules. And, and, the, and the approach, the approaches to solving those are so different, right? I mean, that's one thing that really struck me after take completing unit two. It's like, wow, the way that you approach a, a you know, just a basic recall binary for type me, of question. Yeah, for me, it is. I don't know that it's true for all med students and pharmacists. They might, if it is different. It's like somebody saying when I when I swim in the in the in the lake, it's the same as swimming in the pool. Like they're like, yeah, I'm swimming. I'm 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 swimming. Like I guess there are probably I don't know. Like for me, I like I swim in a, in, a, in like a white water river. You know I swim in a pool. It's different. Um, I think, it but I'm not for swimming. Way. I think it may appear that way. Yes, because you're right. I think there's a lot when you're solving a case vignette question. There's a you know for the very good for the people that have good test taking habits and yes. you know do that really well it just happens unconsciously so to them exactly. it appears like they're using the same processes for in the binary they just know the answer right yes yes but, but there's stuff happening again, subconsciously just like if i'm swimming in the ocean or a lake or a river i'm probably deploy i'm, I'm using different muscles i'm using different response right. mechanisms if i'm running on a track versus running right. on a trail versus running through the woods if it's you're like some muscles. elite runner athlete yeah. you're just like i just run i just run yeah. you know but but you're doing i mean surely you have to acknowledge that like, your foot is falling differently on yes. these different surfaces and your eyes are assessing the ground in front of you in different what well yeah yeah of course they might say but it's like yeah but you didn't say that because the expert does things so innately and so many things happening subconsciously automatically on, on autonomously on the fly but the bad test takers Mm -hmm. The struggling test takers, the ones who don't consistently show what they know, they're the ones that are not able to make those adjustments subconsciously and they pay the price. And that's where I think methodology can come in and mm -hmm. make a huge difference. Oh, yeah. And well, you know. I, and I look at it, uh, you know, I can see, you know, again, you, you're, you've got these categories, bad test taker, good test taker. And I know you would agree with me on this. You know, I think that. You know, there's a spe there's a whole spectrum mm. there, right? And I think you've got your your extremes. Yeah. You know, the exception of the rule are those really great test takers, and you've got some that are just really, really bad. I think for me, as you know, again, experiencing unit one and unit two, I am convinced that the method, you know, could help any. I mean, minus the exceptional test takers, right? But it's there. Yeah. These are just a set of skills and a and an approach that you can use that can benefit anybody. You know, if you're, guess, if you're, a, if you're a B student, yeah. if you're yeah, my, a B student, it might make you an A student. Yeah, yeah. I guess my caveats would be the willingness. Like oh, yeah, what right. Is, you know, that, like, am I willing to to not just right. listen? I, yeah. Am I willing to roll up the sleeves and do the work? Whichever that work might be, that work might not be that hard for some people, you know? Yep. Um, but, yes, I mean, there's definitely something in the back of my mind of, like, what if we did make all the bad test takers good test takers? What does that do to this whole cumbersome testing apparatus that we're right. rolling with? You know what well, I mean? Well, I think – I think it's I – th look, I think it's very, very positive. Actually, it would be a very positive thing, okay? And here's, yeah, and here's why. 
you know, I think that, you know, if there are, if there are faculty members out there that are listening to this, they might be cringing because they think this this is a kind of a system to beat the exams and things like oh, that. Oh, gosh. Yeah, right? please. But that's Disabuse but, that. Yeah, in that's fact, I, I will tell you, to, if I'm being 100 percent honest, I had those those feelings first when I started taking this. And then I realized that's not what this is at all. No. Okay. What, what is this, it? What this does is it eliminates one of the confounding variables okay, that are in your way of collecting accurate data to tell you what your students know and don't know. I never, ever want one of my students to miss an exam question of mine, and, to, and, yeah. and I assume that they don't know something because the, the question was written so poorly, or they got tangled up somewhere, or, you know, they made, a, you know, some sort of reading error that caused them to, whether it was my fault or not, because then I don't get accurate data and an accurate exactly. reader. And I was thinking that. about that when you were saying that. When you yeah. were talking about like the the, the software's uh, data it provides, yeah. what it doesn't, it, it can't do, because we're not cyborgs, is right. tell what was happening in the reader's interpretation of the right. text. Or you know, it's really, it's really it's interesting. That software, and, and this will be something for another time, but that software actually tracks your behavior on the exam. So it will tell you how long it took you to answer each question, whether you yeah. switched answers. Yeah. You know, it's 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 the the you know it's real. I'm just fascinated to see where that goes over time, and and how you, we might be able to use that kind of data to maybe identify bad test taking behavior as a you know kind of diagnostically. I don't know. That's just where my brain goes. I like. Yeah, to, no, it's. It, I, I mean, again, until we until like you track what, what, you, what you do, but it's really interesting to me. Well. No, I mean, eventually, you know, uh, software will probably be able to track where your eyes are on the page. Right, right. Um, and, then, and then that would be – that to they me actually, is – They actually have proctoring software that will do that now. Well, I mean, I know it's coming. Like they're talking well, about they like, have you look it. away. if you we, look away from the computer screen yeah, like, or when you're if, watching yeah, the ads. Exactly. Yep. No, it's it's all coming. It's, it's it's hard to imagine right now, but it might be passe and, and, and just like a done deal in five years. But yeah, yep. like that's coming. Like where, you know, like it'll, it'll say like you were like your eye. I mean, gosh, like be, having like a heat map of where your eyes are going on the on the on the screen would be that's like a, that's like a that'll be a watershed moment yeah. um, where we can get some real data that, that really real interests data, me. Right. So, yeah, but we can but we can teach people to extract that um, with the way we teach them how to do this stuff. So yep. th there's definitely a lot of uh, upsides here. But yes, no, thank you. Like. This is never about beating the test. I think when people hear people talk about test taking, they think you're talking about like how to outsmart or outwit the test. It is the opposite of that. Yep. This is about cleaning up the user interface to yep. level the playing field so that the bad test taker can actually evenly show what he or she knows as opposed to always operating at a deficit. I don't know if I've told you this. Do you know what my theory is on how the bad test taker survives? No. I, I'm, they survive. No, you may, you by, may have, but go I ahead. They survive by overcompensation with overstudying and overknowledge. Yep. And, they, yep. and they, they rely on that binary mentality because to tie all that back, if you rely on knowing it all, either I know it or I don't know it like a first order question, that's what I call the binary mentality. The good yep. test takers are the opposite. They're learning to use their partial knowledge, their fragmentary knowledge, rule things out that are partially false using the parts of what you know and pick the safest of what's left. Safest means which parts of what you know connect with the answer option because the bad test taker kicks away from the partial thing because they so dearly and desperately want to know it all. Yep. They will say, well, I like A, but I don't know everything about A, so I'll pick B, this thing I know less about. That is such a stark uh, pop. I, I worked with one student today, and she that was her primary sin. That was her primary issue. And, and how much anxiety how much anxiety must you generate when you put that kind of pressure on yourself that you have to you think you have to know everything, right? I wonder how suffocating. I wonder, yeah, like I said, you know, I think there's for me, there just feels like there's a this connection there, you know, between student test anxiety, this idea of binary thinking, and the, mm -hmm. the whole idea that, you know what? I have to know every little piece of information in order to answer the question right. Well, guess what? Life doesn't work that way. I mean, yeah. sometimes it does, right? No, it's nice. You know? Sure, it's nice. It's nice when you know everything. It feels good. But it feels good. You can't, but sometimes you've you got you you to wing it with just what you know and you hope, you know. Yeah, yeah relying on that is, is, a, is a very difficult game. And then lastly, we were just going to talk a little bit about, so so I think what, you know, we've talked a lot about, though, is it is much easier to intervene 
once you get to a board prep level. So where we yeah. started and where we'll end is coming back to this idea of the didactic test taking, test taking in the first few years of med school of the PharmD classroom. Um, you asked me, could the system be used to hack into the bad test writers? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Exam? So I don't know if you've had more thoughts on that now that you've watched more of the workshop. I have my thoughts on it. I'll let you go first. I think... Um... I think in certain, it depends on what the problem with the question is. Exactly. I think, yeah. Exactly. I think it, yeah. So I thought about this. I mean, you know, uh, so yeah. So I, I'm going to okay. leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> this I'm is the problem. The problem is that the bad question is a big, gray, fuzzy, fuzzy word. There, it, it, it is, in, it's going to be a bad, uh, so the, the, the questions that fall under the bad question umbrella are going to have varying criteria, various flaws, various mm -hmm. problems. So we can't, you can't build strategy around a moving target, around an inconsistent target. We can build strategies around known quantities, like the way that test questions are built that are statistically normed and validated for the boards. So what, what we tell people is um, what, I, what I think the best way to, to approach test taking in the classroom years is being consistent. So mm -hmm. imagine like an old school video game where you've got like a road and you're driving the car down the middle of the road and that's where the, and you're trying to collect coins or something. Yeah. And the coins are, the, most of the coins are in the major, middle of the, the, the two lanes of the road. But every now and then you'll have coins out on the, on the, on the side. On the sides. I'm following you. Okay. And so what you don't want to be doing is zigzagging, trying to get those outlying coins, like the bad questions, the mm -hmm. trick questions, the, the really gotcha questions. Cause then you're zigzagging out and now you're missing all the coins down the middle of the road. Maybe you're catching the coins on the side of the road. Maybe you're not. But at the end of the day, that's a losing strategy. Miss mm -hmm. the poorly written question. Miss the gotcha question. Drive it right down the middle of the road by being consistent. Consistently yeah. reading. You'll, you'll end up at the end overall in a better place. You're going to. You're, yeah, yeah. And that's the only way with these things. And I would say better study methods are the best solution in the classroom years. Yeah. In other words, I don't, it, it, you know, we just sort of bashed. I guess, sort of, not really, but, you know, we were talking about the, the perils of thinking you need to know everything on boards. I mean, that's real. But as, as look, as much as you have to learn for a single classroom exam, and I know it's a staggering, ridiculous amount, it is a literal like drop in the bucket for your board. Yeah, I think it's the, the time component to that equation, right? You know, we've yeah. always talked about that. You know, the boards, when you take the boards, it's an accumulation of all the knowledge you've, you know, years, you've years. over years, right? Years. It's a lot yeah. of information, but you've had, you know, three, four years, you know, maybe more to accumulate that um, versus, you know, if you had this exam Six week, every two weeks, two weeks, weeks four or weeks, 500 weeks. PowerPoint yes. slides. Yeah. Right. Oh, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's a, it's a whole different game. I know. But when, when we are dealing with the struggling student, the, stu the students that are really trying to like really yeah. get through this, we change the study methods so that they are getting more yield every week, every day, every hour, every minute that they're studying. OK. Mm -hmm. And and then on the other side, we just add some what I would call simple, which is still pretty robust study or test question structure. Yep. So that they are then keeping their, their car down the middle of the road. Yeah. That seems to be the winningest way to approach this without getting all entangled in totally redesigning test taking in those first two years, because it is a lot, it's a lot harder of a game to do mm -hmm. than maybe people think. And that's just what I've been doing for 15 years. So that is my accumulated wisdom on that being sort of shared here. Maybe I can maybe I can take us out with one of your quotes from your workshop because um, uh, well, I think it really I think I think it really will wrap up all of this. You said, you know, the process that you were teaching, right? The stat yeah. med process is not about getting every question right. It's about passing the exam, and it's okay to miss questions. Just super profound, right there. I think if that's, I'm, you know, if I, if I had to pick, choose one take home message for your listeners right now, that would be it. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm sitting here nodding to myself, my own yep. quote. That's weird. Uh, yep. But I yeah, gotta, I mean, that, my notes. Mm -hmm. that's the game. That's the game. Yeah. And I think it's really important to frame the game when you're trying to win. Right. And that's what we're doing here. All right. Well, thanks. Hey, hey, thank you, Jim, for uh, 
indulging and, and having that a, a nice, weirdly rambly, but in-depth conversation about test taking. Yeah, and, absolutely. My pleasure. And, lis- and listeners, thanks for listening. We'll be back with more soon. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the StatMed Podcast. If you like the show, please be sure to rate it on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can find more test-taking and studying strategies specifically designed for med students and physicians over at our blog at statmedlearning.com. Thanks for listening.